a very quick uh, welcome to um, the Sheridan's Back Page podcast. Um, it's also going out um, as a YouTube as well, but the, the main idea is for um, the Sheridan's team to welcome good friends um, of the firm um, and talk through lots of different and interesting um, areas. And I'm delighted that we've got Dave and Anna of EPP um, Recruitment to be able to Excuse me, something literally got stuck in my throat at that exact second. But I'm going to keep <laughs> have us um, uh, to be with us this afternoon. And um, we're going to, apart from a few technical issues that we had slightly earlier and a frog in my, a frog in my throat, we're going to keep going as much as we can um, and just talk generally about something which isn't really law, um, but very much is to do with um, Dave and Anna's sweet spot of um, search selection, recruitment, um, advisory, um, and the work that they generally do in the sports space. So thank you guys for joining. It's amazing to have you on. I'm going to shut up and not speak as much now because you guys are certainly still add the value to the discussion. And, um, and thanks, for, thanks for getting involved. I oh, know you're welcome. Thanks, Dan. It's, it's great, to, um, great to be on here. I know you, um, you said you wanted me just to kind of give a quick introduction of us and then a couple of the principles and you equally said you're going to give me a wave when I was kind of rabbiting on for too long. So um, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that. So just to quickly give an explanation of, of us, as, as Dan said, we're not law specialists, but we're a, a partner-led elite sport search and advisory firm, very much specializing in performance. Um, we were set up, I co-founded the business six, seven years ago, uh, having come from a, from performance sport background myself um, and just noticing there's a bit of a gap in the market there. Uh, we now, um, recruitment at the heart of what we do, we do, as I, we're an advisory firm as well around kind of systems and structures, um, trying to get our clients from, from where they are to where they want to do and we really look at a fair strand of um, developing existing talent within organisations. organizations so I guess a development strand, but the core of what we do is recruitment. Um, I know you've done some work around kind of people near the start of their journeys, um, uh, coming out of university perhaps and, and wanting to move into sport. Um, where we sit is more at the kind of the senior level, the kind of C-suite stuff and senior performance leaders. But what's fascinating, having listened to a couple of the things that you do, is that actually a lot of those skills that you talk about are completely transferable. And what sets the best people at the top of their um, industry, whether it's performance, whether it's senior leadership from the executive side, um, are largely transferable and they're largely the same. Technical skills clearly different. Um, um, the type of people who come through well um, come through well wherever they are. Um, onto that, we we were talking. We have two key principles that we operate um, to when it comes to search, and I know. Um, you kind of thought, oh, that, yeah, they, they sound good. I'd like to hear a bit more about them. So the two key principles that we kind of adhere to when it comes to search is any role that we do is 50% culture, 50% capabilities. So whenever we look at something, um, it's just as important as opposed to the technical expertise that you might have or need in a role, it's that you think about the fit within that organization. Um, and so you really scrutinize, you know, what the values might be, your values might be what you believe, what environment you want to work in, what type of people you want to work in, um, as well as we say, obviously, those qualifications um, that you put on top. Um, Anna's got some great examples from the corporate setting in a minute, which I'll let her share. Um, and the second one is that no one's more than an 80% fit against a theoretical brief. And so the way we work is that with our client, we couldn't client whatever the role might be, we'll come up with a set of criteria. Um, you will, you'll see just job descriptions where there'll be 20, sometimes 30 responsibilities uh, that you would need to do in a role. I mean, nobody in the world could be could do them. If you look at them, you're like, well, it's just nobody could do all of them. So the key here is that you have to prioritize. Um, and we will boil it down to between four and six key criteria. Um, and that's what we would assess people against. Um, and we've realized that... Um, it's very, very rare that somebody would fit against all of them. So, and what that enables, I guess it leads to a level of humility of people realizing that, I guess a level of self-awareness that you can get better um, and it, you don't have to be brilliant at everything. Um, and 
people will realize anyway that you're not. So it's probably best just to admit it <laughs> that you haven't got everything. Um, but equally, it shows that you can get up to 90 or 95. And I think our leadership development piece has grown out of that, um, of the recognition that you can get better. Um, so yeah, that, that's our two principles. Um, Anna, I'll let you, I, I'm sure I've missed out a bunch of stuff there. Um, but yeah, there are two core principles that we adhere to on any role. Um, and yeah, that's it. Great. Um, so, uh, so I, I guess, you know, I, I came into the business with a slightly different lens. So if, if Dave's background has always been sports, I came from the, from the corporate world into, into this role and into EPP. And I think one of the things that jumped out for me was that within the world I used to work in, and admittedly I did work in marketing and advertising, so a very sort of brand and audience focused sector, but people were incredibly aware of the cultures of the companies that they worked in and incredibly aware of the cultures of the, that they therefore fitted in as a person. And what I found coming into the world of sport was that despite the fact that um, fans can be so passionate, that, that clubs can have a real identity about them, people couldn't necessarily articulate what the culture was like to actually work there. And very early on in working with Dave, we worked on briefs where we would have candidates for two, you know, completely different kinds of people wanting to go for the same role or clubs interviewing candidates from, from, from completely different um, other backgrounds, other, uh, you know, uh, other places and not seeing that just to fit in one doesn't mean that you're fitting in another. And I think that's the, the key point between the 50% culture, 50% capabilities is you can be, have all the skills that you need to do a role but actually you will only thrive in that culture if you also have shared values shared beliefs and you fit well within the team an example i often use from my sort of corporate life was um, working on pretty much exactly the same brief in terms of capabilities for amazon and for lego and actually uh you know on paper the same person could have done both roles but when you came down to it, the culture of those two organizations is completely different. And to sort of completely oversimplify, um, the main difference being at Amazon, a lot of what you need to do is prove your ability to do something uh, yourself. So when in, in interview, people talk a lot about I, they talk about their achievements, their successes. Whereas at Lego, there's a very collaborative culture where everything is about team and everything is about we. And you cannot be both you're one type of leader or, or another. And you can fudge that, you can learn how to interview against that and you can tell stories and, and, and kind of give examples even that, that sort of fit those two different things. But going into work day in, day out, you are one or you are the other, you cannot be both. And, and therefore you won't thrive in both environments. And I think that's one of the things that sort of really jumped out to me is us helping our clients articulate what their cultures are, but then helping candidates understand which ones they fit. And that actually it doesn't matter if you don't fit all. In fact, it's a good thing if you don't fit all, because what it probably means is you've got your own values and beliefs um, and, and, and kind of um, ethical system that, that works for you. Yeah. And, and I think what, what's true, I mean, you can, Dan, I'm sure you'd be able to think of, of many of your clients or, or football, you know, we've worked with you, know, half a dozen Premier League football teams and, and you think of work we did with one this year and what, and you know that somebody who would fit in that one absolutely would not fit in the other. And there's not a right or wrong, a good or bad. Well, sometimes there is, but in this instance, you know, they're just different. And, if, and until you realise that as a candidate and realise which organisations you might want to fit into, until you realise that, you kind of almost up against it because it, it makes it more equal. It's kind of like dating. It's got to fit for both sides. And I think as soon as you realize that, you can relax a bit actually because you, you're not going to fit everywhere. And I think people look so much around um, the skills they need to learn to be able to do the job, whereas they don't think of the type of person they need to be to thrive. And I think, you know, we, we were joking about it before, but when people come to you about their CV and they talk about, you know, what does it look like? And it is important that it, it comes across well um, and it's well formatted and, you know, you've taken care and you've made your spelling right. You know, things like that do matter. Um, but equally, you know, you don't want to over engineer it to be not you. So when somebody says, you know, or if somebody was to say, oh, why did you stay there for that long? Because, oh, well, I just thought it looked good on my CV. I thought it was important that I stayed somewhere for two years. You're like, no, 
we'd actually think less of you if you stayed somewhere you, you didn't want to for two years. It doesn't matter as long as you, your story is authentically yours and you can tell it and it means something to you and you're passionate about it. I think, you know, that's what we think is more important and that's what sets the better people apart, you know, especially when you've, you've got hundreds of TVs to look at. The thing that makes it stand out, I mean, the way we work is you probably would need a level of experience before you get the more senior roles. But up until that point, the people who've done interesting things or really committed to something early on um, actually set them apart. You, that's why we always, you know, consistency is the thing that, or inconsistency, sorry, is the other things that get that we have red flags for when you're speaking to people. Like, oh, okay, we well, did that, but you didn't do that. And so that's where we get people to tell their story because if you tell a story, it's very, very difficult to make that up. And it shows so much of where people, you know, if, if we only had one question to ask, it'd be, you know, tell me about your upbringing. Because people then suddenly forget about an interview and suddenly start thinking, and I know how to gamify and how to hack it. And it's about more about what they're like as a person and where they came from. And it's really um, quite uh, powerful when people tell that story. Can I ask one, one thing that um, I've realized now that <laughs> I didn't necessarily prepare you for for a question I was going to ask beforehand, so apologies now I'm putting you right in it. But as, I was, but as Anna and yourself were talking about that, all of those points, um, it got me thinking about maybe if it's the right way of saying it, the, the old school way that used to be within sport, or maybe still is to a degree, which is you know, when people are recruiting for lots of different roles, regardless of exactly what you said, if it's C-suite, leadership, um, um, you know, performance, whatever, whatever it might be, which are very much in your sweet spots, of how much um, value or how much education has to be attached to um, demonstrating your value to others and be able to demonstrate that the right quality of candidate is within your grasp and then within their grasp for the fit to be better than the old school recruitment way of who do you know and where have they been and they're obviously good guys because they've been in the industry for a long time. How, how do you almost then become the respected like disruptor or maybe that might be the right way of doing it to be able to show a sort of fresher approach to, 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 to the game that you're in? Really? Yeah, no, and it's a really good point. And I think one of the, you know, before I set this business up, I worked in the chemical and energy sectors for four years across Europe. And I think in those sectors, in outside of sport, you are competing against three or four other search firms for roles, but you're definitely not searching. To, you know, you're not competing against people not understanding what search is. So, you know, fifty percent of our time is because it's just new to this to sport. And in many ways, for us, um, for a sector that is so um, hijacked by emotion it's the one that you think it would need it the most. And, and your point around, you know, relationships are important, but so is performance. So, and so is diversity of teams. And so often people just choose people like themselves. And it's particularly topical at the moment. But, you know, the diversity piece that we see is not an ethic or moral issue. I mean, it clearly is, but it's a performance one. You know, there's so much research on diverse teams outperforming homogenous ones. And so you've got to look at any role in the breadth of the whole team and it's something that people sometimes struggle with um equally you still want to have a network within and i guess it's comforting um to know that somebody kind of gets it or understands the sector there's a you know, trust plays such a big part in sport more than probably any other industry in a way and that sense that people understand the sport um and it's not you know we do a lot of work in football like yourself but it isn't just football uh, you know a lot of the big team sports especially are like this um, where experience is overemphasized above skill, whereas potential is hard to get in there when you expect somebody to have, you know, 10 years experience. And, and we, one of the things we struggle with a lot is, yeah, we, we have to explain why you would run a process this way. We, we kind of try to get that position of being a kind of a trusted advisor where we can be that external, um, almost critical friend where you, we can just test what you're doing and, and just check whether you're going about it the right way. Um, but what we come up against a lot is, oh, I know this person. And then somebody else mentioned him and somebody else. And before you know it, three people on the senior executive have decided that this person's the right fit, even though they haven't agreed on the criteria for, for why that person, and it is probably going to be different, but there's some comfort of, oh, no, I know that name. 
he, he's, you know, if you're looking at coaches in particular, he's coached before. Oh, he's been a CEO of a football club before. So he must know, well, the football club bit isn't the bit really that sets apart the best people. It, it, it just isn't. So not that there aren't good CEOs in football clubs. Of course there are. Um, but why would you narrow down your kind of pool of candidates when actually what we try and do is show them that there are different criteria that you want to look for? Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, you asked the question about people coming with names and, you know, again, coming from the corporate world, you didn't really tend to do that because it's a slightly, people, people aren't famous in the same way. People aren't, there's, a, there's a much smaller candidate pool in sport, depending even, you know, particularly in head coaches, but actually across the board, it's a discrete universe and, and people tend to know each other. And in a funny way, there's nothing wrong with having names as long as you're using those names for the right thing. So if it's a springboard for discussion, if it's about understanding, okay, well, I think this person's good. Well, why do you think they're good? Oh, because they do this. Okay, so that's something that's important, is it, that they're able to, um, if they've got this particular skill or they're able to behave in this particular way. That can be really useful as a way of kind of articulating a brief. But as Dave says, what, what's dangerous is I'll come in with a name you'll both come in with a name. It's all the same name, but we, we, we like them for different reasons. And we might even like them for different parts of their career. So I might be remembering having worked with them 15 years ago and they've changed dramatically since then. Whereas actually you're judging them on behaviors from last week. And so for us, it's about start with what are you looking for? What's the strategy? What's the vision? What do you need to do? What shape is the hole that you're trying to fill? Articulate that. And then let's look at people and measure them against that. And even if we end up, you know, we, we have a lot of debate about gut reaction and gut, gut feeling and how important that is in, in making recruitment hires and, 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 you know, the use of data and all that sort of stuff. But it's okay to use your gut as long as you know why and what it's telling you. So it's fine for us to sort of have five or six criteria and actually ignore them because somebody else is coming from left of field that we think is brilliant but we need to know that we're doing that and understand why we're doing that so that we then don't judge them and set kpis for them that don't fit the reasons we brought them in and i think that's where it can get very wishy-washy as we you know big names exciting names people get hired the expectations don't measure don't, don't fit they don't know what they're being hired for nobody knows what success looks like and then suddenly you're being judged on something that you didn't even think you were you were there to do and you yeah. know i guess one of the interesting things is if you look at how people i'm now definitely going to talk about things i don't know about but if you if you look at how people who i how i believe people recruit players the amount of time you would spend watching talent developing talent understanding where they fit how they fit potential etc not you know the, the, amount, the amount of time spent on that is enormous and yet you hire all those people around them and the same process isn't isn't put in place, and that's what sort of feels odd. Yeah, no, and, and I think your your point around it's important that you have people within this within a club setting who understand the club, understand its identity, understand what makes it unique. You know, we had a we had a search for a, a championship head coach last year, whereby thankfully there was a, a really good chairman who knew what he wanted, but then he also had a. Um, an ex-player who'd been there for a long time, who had led, um, you know, be, had been through maybe I think ten or twelve different managers, and you know, we just asked him what was who was the best, and he gave us a name, and and obviously that is a person. So it's like, okay, let's break it down as to why, and there was four or five very clear reasons why that person was the best, and so we, because of the way we look at the world, we're like, okay, so is this the criteria then? We're looking for this, 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 and this. And it might be man management, it might be developing young players, it might be whatever, but it doesn't. And, and they were like, and suddenly having been actually a little bit apart, it was like, no, no, they, those are the things that are important. So we're like, okay, so what, where does experience come in that of, of managing in the championship? Well, it's not on there. Well, is it important? Because it's okay to be important, but you've got to recognise it now. Um, and... That's the bit about at any level about where experience sits in it, as opposed to the skills that you need and the passion that you need to show, um, which I think is an, an important piece to to put in there too. And also, you know, no, no hire is ever just about one person, and that's that's on both sides. So, if I'm looking at someone and, and looking at what they've achieved, I need to look at the team of people around them. You know, that again, you use the example of a manager, you can have a manager who has done pretty much everything on their own and you can have someone who has an absolutely fantastic team of people surrounding them. 
they are going to have different skills, have done different things and have worked in different ways. You then got to look at, again, the, the, the size of the hole and the shape of the hole that you're, lo you're looking to fill. And this is where the 80% fit bit comes in, which is, you know, we will write a theoretical brief that is what we believe we're looking for to find someone who is available on budget, wants to come, that has the, uh, as a good cultural fit and has all the capabilities against that is, is pretty impossible. And actually we would argue they probably aren't a great fit because if they're a hundred percent within about six months, they're going to have itchy feet because there's nothing, nowhere for them to go and, and nothing for them to grow into. But so, you know, they're not, they're not going to fit everything. And at that point you've then got to look around them and think, well, what team am I going to support this person with? Who else is in, you know, any role in sports at any level, there is a team surrounding you. So who are they? Where else can we support skills that this person is lacking? Where can we help develop them? Where's the potential? And the whole thing's a balance. And that's where a name is really dangerous because you're judging people on what they've done before and where they are now, not where they might go next. Yeah. I think if you look further down somebody's career, if you look at the start of somebody's career as well, you, you have a decision to be, and we you know, get a lot of people come to us about, um, quite a lot of people transitioning out of sport actually because that's what I did but you, you kind of look at it and go what should I do at the start of my career where should I go should I be a kind of a big fish in a small pond or the opposite so should I go to a big firm and learn the, learn the ropes learn the training um, or should I go to a smaller firm where I can do more um, and there's not a right answer to that it's more about your personality and the type of um, the type of person that you are um, and sometimes it's you know, especially when people are at the start of the career, it's so tempting just to say yes because you want to get in. And often that's really not the right thing to do. You now, I feel really lucky. There's a couple of things that I could have got into um, and I said no to because I just couldn't picture myself 10 or 20 years down the line doing that. And I think sometimes it's good to think further in the future of what you, where you want to end up. And you, want to, you, know, you actually want to have fun as well. So the people that you're around do matter. It's not, you want to, you do want to plan your career, but you don't want to forensically do it. It's the part that you forget to enjoy it. So there is a balance here always in these things. And it just that, that, that last bit actually sort of resonated to a degree in that some of the things that I always say to people wanting to break it, break into the industry a lot of the time, almost is the counterintuitive position, which is don't worry about breaking into the industry. Yeah. Um, in a way, so it was sort of two questions. One was to Anna and one was back to you, Dave. But I was always like, you know, for a long time in my legal career, I, I wasn't doing a huge amount of sports work. I was sort of doing competition law, regulatory, across tons of different sectors that had nothing to do with sports. If it was telco or aviation or media or agriculture or automotive, part, whatever, you know, literally as broad a range as you can imagine. Um, but but what 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 I tried to do at the same time was one build a pretty good underlying skill set, which I thought would be useful for the longer term. If I wanted to transition into sports, i.e. I thought I could draft and negotiate a good contract. I thought I could read the regulations quite well. And I felt like I could deal with disputes and understand intellectual property, for example. And they were four of the areas that I thought as a sports lawyer, I would be, it'd be quite important for me to, to, to have on board. Um, but I, I, so, so that got me thinking then, Anna, about the point that you started off by saying, which was, you know, you were coming in as an outsider into sport. And in that yeah. sense, what, what, what do you, what's your sense of people wanting sometimes to work in this crazy industry? What, what's the allure of, I know what the allure is of working in sport, but if it is, um, you know, how easy is it to, to sometimes transition those skills from industries that aren't sports related but then would fit quite nicely into a variety of sporting um, responsibilities and, you know, uh, jobs more generally. I mean, the, the headhunter head answer or the Anna answer is it shouldn't matter. So uh, we believe very strongly in lateral moves and, and that's actually sport to sport as well as out of sport to in sport. So if you were to ask us to define the best performance people out there, we would straight away say they are, arguably some of the best are the ones who have worked in multiple sports and have moved from one to the other because what they're taking across is their performance understanding their strategic thinking their leadership skills rather than an in-depth knowledge of a game which actually can be learned you know uh, uh, but um, and, and I would argue that's the same coming from outside of sports to inside of sports so the sort of on paper answer is you know, with the exception of a very technical role on the pitch, um, you know, it, things should be transferable. 
the reality that I have discovered in, in moving in is, is there is a truth that sport trusts sports and that um, there is an innate understanding between people who've been in the sector for a long time, which as an outsider, you just have to, you have to accept. And actually I'm kind of okay with that because I don't think, I, I don't know anything like as much about sport as any of the people I work with day to day, but that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to bring a different lens and a different view and I can see the value in what I bring. So for me, it's very much about understanding what, what can you bring and what are you going to learn? You're not there to be the sports expert. The, the people who've, who've worked in it since they dot are and who've played and who you're there to bring a different point of view, a different lens to ask questions from a, in a way that other people wouldn't ask them. And to me, there is an enormous amount of value in that. Not, not every club sees that and not every sport sees that. So there are definitely there are sports who are more open to it than others. And there are definitely clubs and teams that are more open to it than others. But those are probably the ones where, where you're going to thrive. Um, what I would say, though, is there is a piece about, about the language as well. And, and this is for, as true, again, from going from technical practitioner-led roles to more senior positions as it is from going from the corporate world into the sports world and vice versa, which is you need to speak the language of your audience. So whether that's a, um, a brilliant performance leader speaking the language of the boardroom in order to, to get their point across, or that is someone coming from the corporate world being able to speak the language of sport, the more you listen to it and the more exposure you have to it, the more that you understand there's a certain way that conversations happen and the more that you can be involved in those conversations and, and, and use the same language as other people, the easier it's going to be. So a bit, a bit like I imagine you did, we would encourage people. You know, so many people come to us. And actually, again, this is another sort of classic thing that I've noticed in sports. A lot of people do masters including me, um, but a lot, of, and Dave, a lot of people do, do masters, a lot of people do PhDs, a lot of people go into um, education to, to feel like they're filling that gap and there can be value in it. But the question we would ask is why are you doing it? So, you know, if you, or, or people go and get, want to be, everyone wants to be a non-exec or everybody wants to be a trustee or something. And again, why are you doing it? So if there is a piece a skill set that you're missing, a piece that you're missing on your CV. You've never, you've never had budgetary responsibility for something and your dream job in sport requires that. Then I would say, brilliant, go out there and be a governor of a school, but, but be the one that looks after the, the treasury, be the one that does the finance bit, not the one that does something else because that's the piece you're missing. You know, if you, um, think of another example but you know it's all, it's all that kind of stuff if you need to understand governance do the course that tells you about governance but don't just go and do an, an MBA if, if you've already got the business skills you know and, and it's about sort of understanding what pieces you're missing and then getting that experience um, that will allow you to to go into another area could have told me that before I started yeah but you didn't you needed it <laughs> <laughs> she's right <laughs> Her business background yeah, but, but that's exactly true. You didn't have a business background, so an MBA is brilliant. Hmm. I didn't have a sports background, so I'm writing a master's about transition, you know. Yeah, true. We live in the dream. <laughs> <laughs> that's the interesting thing as well, because I think sometimes it's almost like people feel that they need to have that educational structure as a hmm. justification for them going into a sector. When I, I, I think, I agree, I'm almost, sometimes, I can only speak with my law hat on, literally my law cap on, saying, you know, my, my legal skill set is such that if I was quite an innately, uh, I, I, I spent enough time understanding the particular sector mixed with the skill set that would be very useful for that sector, that's almost the way that it at least has worked for me quite well rather than a lot of people saying I think the only way I'm going to get a job in sport is if I do a sports MBA or if I do a sports masters or if I do something which justifies on my CV that I can do it rather than exactly as you said the reasons why it would be useful for a, a core additional competency sounds like the sounds like the, the, the idea I, but, okay. equally the biggest danger there is that just because you've done a course doesn't mean you then understand or have the skills that you know it's just because there's such a there's a chasm there often and the very best people are genuinely humble you know they, they don't actually there's probably a slight difference from performance to you know we get plenty of ceos who are more than happy to talk about themselves and 
And again, it's not a criticism. They need to because they need to be out there talking about their club or their organisation. The performance leaders are, are a little bit less from that. They don't. You never want to put your head above the parapet and say how great you are because you very quickly you'll lose. Um, and I think, but the, we we see people coming in, and because they've been on a course or two, there is a, a lack of humility. And there's like, oh no, but and it's not. It's actually just insecurity or lack of confidence because they they feel the need to say they know how to do something. Where actually you, you don't. You can. You need to have some competence. You need to learn quickly, but you don't have to go in and say you know it. You know, in fact, people love being asked for advice and help. Um, if you just you know, not all the time, but if you if you go in and go, I'm, I'm a quick learner. I will pick this stuff up, and you have a passion for development and for learning, um, then you should be fine. But don't like the BS that you can get about people. You know, you can see it a mile off, and you and people, you can understand why it comes from a good place of I need to show that I can do it. Um, whereas actually it's the opposite skills that you need to show or being able to learn really also going back to what you said earlier Dave about being authentic to your story you know exactly what you're saying Dan for me you know the question people sometimes forget to ask themselves is what can I bring so you know they're so busy sort of looking at a job description, getting the, the courses and the sort of CV together that, that say that, that you can do the job. But there are loads of other candidates also going forward for that. So what, what can you bring that they can't? And the reality is, if, you're up, if you haven't worked in sport and you're up against someone who has, you are not going to beat them on the having worked in sport question. You're just not, because they've got that 15 years of experience and you don't. But what you've got is a different set of experience, a different lens and a different point of view. And that is why you would add value to that role. A company or a club that doesn't see that probably wouldn't value your experience and you probably wouldn't enjoy it when you got there. So for me, it's about that authenticity. And yes, there absolutely might be certain courses that you need to you know, tick a box or, or get, a, get a very specific technical skill set that you didn't have before or a piece of understanding. But the, the bigger question is about, is about you know, what, how and why would I add value in this role? it's not going to be because I know everything there is to know about football because I don't. But what I do know is that I've worked with 15 of the top brands in the world and they all do it differently. And I can come and give you a point of view on why they do it differently and how they do it differently. And even if you don't change, we can have a really interesting debate that will either consolidate what's already being done or, or allow for, for, th for things to move, move in a different direction. And, and we've probably placed... You know, I could think of half a dozen people within football who had never worked in football. Um, so clearly with those, with the criteria there at least um, allowed you to present a shortlist that had a mix of, of skills and of experience. And they all did the same things at interview when, first of all, they, and I think this is true of anybody at any stage of their career, they articulated it early so they spotted the gap that they have and and hide you know and highlighted it so suddenly they were like oh we were all thinking it so i'm glad you've addressed it so okay if you don't see it, it's a problem then maybe we shouldn't and then they all and this is i guess some of these are pretty senior leaders so this could be slightly different to a more junior practitioner but i still think it applies they were able to kind of articulate a vision of what the future could look like with them in the role and it's particularly powerful if you can paint a picture for somebody of what it might look like because suddenly whether you your experiences are relevant if you're able to you know the best leaders are able to do that and if you're taking people on a journey with you and i can think of one specific example where you know this happened and the ceo of a large organization came out and went oh my word that's the most impressive person i think i've ever met no experience in the sport but it didn't matter because the fundamental core um, activities of that person would need to do their job well um, that highlighted in you know in that two hours so um yeah interesting on the flip side just to uh, go against everything we've just said you know it can also work the other way so we recently um did some some work some work in sort of with with data analyst roles and uh we had this nice list of technical criteria that was required that actually is more likely to be found in the corporate world than it is in the sports world because it's quite a new a new industry or a new, a new part of, of, of sport. And, and um, there were certain degree levels required. There were certain um, technical skills and kind of software and technology skills required. Um, and actually, the person that got the role didn't meet quite a few of those criteria, but what they had was an ability to work with and evidence that they could work with and speak to coaches. 
and 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 the brief that we had was this this combination of you needed to be able to do the data piece but you needed to then be able to translate that data piece into into language that the people that needed it could understand and you know looking at the 80 percent the candidates from the corporate space all had the skills and spades but what they didn't have was that experience of how to walk into a room and convince a group of people that they'd never worked with before of their point of view what the candidate that was successful had was exactly that and it could be taught some of the data stuff and and that's just really interesting and that's the point is that you know maybe there was a perfect person out there that had both but you know pretty hard to find we didn't find them um and, uh, and and it actually didn't matter but that but at least by having those criteria we were able to have the conversation which said oh all the things we thought were important are actually less important because there's this thing over here which is everything mm. and we actually need to go in that direction and without criteria and, and that understanding it would be very hard to unpick why that was right very cool um on that note, and I certainly would love to keep the conversation going, and maybe after we've had a, um, you guys have uh, done a bit, um, well, even more recruitment stuff, we can have a catch up on some more stories, because I think the stories are fantastic and just really illustrative of the different approaches that sports is taking. I've always got a couple of um, last quick fire questions for you guys. Um, not too much pressure, at least on, on Anna, there's not too much pressure. There's probably a bit much pressure on Dave. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the first question is, Dave, when um, are you going to get a top knot? For you? <laughs> Do you know what? I have actually had one already. So um, uh, my two sons, I love football, and they asked me if I could look like Gareth Bale. And um, I'll send you the photo, actually. I'm not going to lie, I quite liked it too. Um, <laughs> but it is a bit out of control. This is about as, as low as it's been for a while. So um, thank you. I'm glad you like it. I really appreciate that. I'm just jealous, basically. <laughs> Um, so and then the, the actual real question I was going to ask every all, all guests on the um, on the podcast just to answer is I'm always really interested in um, you know stuff that people are either reading, consuming, watching. Generally, if it's books or Netflix or articles or whatever else it might be, if there's um, anything that's on your watch list, to do list, book list, more generally that you you've enjoyed maybe in lockdown period and I don't mind who goes first or otherwise, um, I'm always keen to hear any good recommendations. Um, okay, I've got, so there's a few, there's a lot I listen to. So I guess if I had to, the podcast that I listen to the most um, is Michael Gervais' Finding Mastery one. So he interviews, uh, for a few reasons, he's a very good interviewer, so it's actually quite good for us, but it's also in the kind of performance space, some leaders, so I listen to that a lot. Um, and... I guess if you look at so Netflix, I actually probably got COVID. I can't believe I haven't mentioned that yet. So I was in lockdown for a week, so I got to watch quite a lot of TV. So I watched all of the All or Nothings, yeah. um, and obviously the Last Dance has been mentioned a lot, and it is brilliant. I, I think I, I, you know nostalgia for some for somebody of our age, Dan, um, to remember like the mid nineties. You know, I just bought yeah. some Air Jordans just because you know they were trainers I wasn't allowed to wear when I was a kid. Um, but so that is brilliant, um, and. What am I reading? So I, I read so many self-help books that my wife is like, will you just read a novel? This is painful. So I've just finished Normal People, which is excellent. Um, I'm reading Ray Dalio's Principles now, which is kind of back, back to a bit more comfortable into kind of my space. Um, David Epstein's Range was excellent. I really enjoyed that, especially with what we do. Um, so I could go on, but I'll, uh, I'll let Anna have a go. <laughs> I only asked for one, Anna, and he gives me yeah, some. Yeah, I know, I know. This is just a classic Dave. I did. I just listen, I just listen to white noise every evening just to block out the Dave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, mine are really boring because um, I'm just at the end of writing a dissertation. So my kind of workbook for that is, um, which is vaguely relevant to this, is I've been reading a book called Working Identity by Ivara, who is slightly heavy because it's a sort of slightly academic book, but it's about transition and it's about how everybody has multiple identities and how to work out how to transition from one kind of role to another. So it is actually really interesting, um, particularly if you read the beginning and the end and not necessarily all the, the bits in the middle. Um, in terms of a novel, I've been reading Priest Daddy by uh, Patricia Lockwood, which is um, brilliant in lockdown because it's a very funny um, autobiography of someone who grew up with a guitar strumming 
walking around in his pants Catholic priest father um, <laughs> and you know had this crazy very different life to mine certainly in America um, so it's sort of quite a nice escapism and really embarrassingly and I can't believe I'm going to say this on the podcast I am watching a program from 2006 because I'm that behind the times but so Dave's constantly telling me that I should be watching sports stuff and learning about sports so I've been learning about American football and I've been watching Friday Night Lights um, for courtesy of Dave and uh, the extra embarrassing thing about it is I got so passionate about sporting the Panthers that my husband bought me my first ever sports t-shirt Dylan Panthers and it took so long to arrive in lockdown that by the time this is not a spoiler because you were filming the is 14 years old you can actually cut this and make this but, into a yeah, special but this is this is so much worse so by the time the t-shirt arrived the coach has moved on and is now coaching the Lions so I've now got a Lions t-shirt as well <laughs> Very cool. There you go. Very cool. Really embarrassing. Really old. But I've learned quite a lot about American football, which is good. I actually really thought you were going to say Love Island. <laughs> no, no, never. Are we allowed to ask you the same question back? Uh, yes, I've actually never been asked that, actually, because I'm usually asking everyone else. But um, I am re- I'm rereading this, which is um, Angela Duckworth. Your book, is it? Dundee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rereading Dundee. So Grit by Angela Duckworth that I really like. So I've, um, I've read that before, which I love. I'm, uh, podcasts, I've actually been listening to Desert Island Discs quite a lot recently. I'd yeah. never really listened to that many over the years. And then yeah, I've been doing that a little bit more. I think that's my front door going. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with the test on Amazon, which I've really enjoyed. That I started watching in the beginning of lockdown. I think I could have said the last dance, but I loved the journey that... Um, um, that um, sort of came about from ball tampering where it almost started back to the ashes. So, um, I, yeah, that's probably what I would, um, what I would probably mention. Yeah, it was great. I, it's so weird. You actually started to like Australians. It was weird. Like, there was, you know, they all came across really well. Um, yeah, that kind of it was bizarre. <laughs> I was watching it in 14 years' time. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I, for- I forgot my up to, yes, you, you liking the Aussies, was that what you were saying? <laughs> how how likeable they were, yeah. It was, I thought, you know, just what we're all talking about there, I love the fact that, um, that the recruitment, f- firstly, um, you know, obviously the, the guys being suspended for quite a lot and long time um, of that year period, and then, um, you know, how they effectively recruited the Aussie team, bearing in mind all of them were effectively ex-internationals. And that, anyway, we're going off topic now a tiny bit, but I, how there wasn't an outsider brought in for that. It was very much back to basics, back to identity, back to be able to find the core of why Australian cricket was important to so many people. And the only people effectively that could do that were people that were already within the dressing room from years gone by. Yeah, I, I thought there's some lovely moments in it because especially you know, being able to see into just showing that, you know, these are human beings too and the coaches have, have, have worries and concerns about how they do. So the moment where, you know, Justin Langer as the head coach has been deliberately, you know, they've come through a difficult patch. So he's been really kind of quite protective with them. He's not criticising too much. And then they lose like again or something and he just loses it. And he just goes, you know, you've not done anything. You've all got these techniques. Doesn't matter. You need to win or something along those lines. And then they're pretty tough. And and then he came in the following day with his coaching group. He's just he's just like, and you, you know you, you've got the cameras are in there. It's like guys, was that a mis- did I did I cock up there? Was that a mistake? And it was so nice to see that vulnerability to see him actually going. I just don't you know. And it's just you know, coaches have that too you know. And and everybody was like, no, no, that and it is Ricky Ponting who's telling him that he did the right thing. So quite nice to have somebody of that level. But. You, you know, you saw a little bit more of them as people, which I think is what's good about a lot of these things is that they're not machines that, you know, you see on the TV. These are real people who it really affects. So I kind of, yeah, really like that side of it. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. So on that note, and apologies for the slight interruptions, <laughs> doorbell ringing, etc. cetera. Um, thanks very much for joining me. And um, we'll uh, hopefully get a chance to speak soon. And um, yeah, we'll, this will go live sooner rather than later, hopefully. So thanks again. Thanks, Dad. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye. Bye.